Let's open our Bibles here this afternoon, please. Genesis chapter 10. Genesis 10. And having completed a study last Thursday night through Genesis chapter 9, I am resuming our study today. Through these early chapters of Genesis, with today a quick synopsis through what is commonly referred to as the Table of Nations in chapter 10, and then moving on into the first nine verses of chapter 11, with application then today on how current global events, including massive immigration invasions, transhumanism, and a new pathogen referred to as disease X, relate to the confusion of tongues that God caused to take place at the Tower of Babel. And there's so much to share along those lines, it's going to take me at least two messages to get through all that I need to put on the table. Here in chapter 10 of Genesis, we are given the genealogy of each of Noah's three sons and the dispersion of their descendants into 70 nations, covering actually a process of development and rapid increase of population under the Noahic covenant through a timeline that stretches from the days of Noah to the days of Abraham. As with all genealogies in the Bible, Family lineage here is traced through the patriarchal line, through the fathers of the sons. And this is the last chapter of the Old Testament, actually, that treats the whole human race historically. Except for a summarized restatement of this same genealogy in First Chronicles chapter 1 and the prophecy of the Gog and Magog war of Ezekiel 38 and various references to the Gentiles. After this chapter, we hear no more about the descendants of Japheth until Paul and his companions take the gospel to them in the New Testament. And the focus, the storyline, and of later genealogies in the Old Testament then turns to Shem alone, particularly, of course, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Shem's descendants, who, on the other hand, of course, do have frequent interactions and dealings, disputes with the descendants of Ham, primarily with Egypt and the, you know, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Syrians, and the Babylonians, all of whom were descendants of Ham. And so then beginning in verse 1, Genesis chapter 10, we read, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were born sons after the flood. Again, though Noah lived 950 years, these are the only sons that Noah had. And verse 32 of chapter 5 tells us that they were each born a hundred years before the flood when Noah was 500 years old. So the indication from that verse is that they were triplets. Although I, it's doubtful, but I suppose that one of them could have been born less than a year either before or after the other two and still be born in Noah's 500th year from verse 24 of chapter 9, we do know that Ham was the youngest of the three sons. And then verse 21 of this chapter tells us that Japheth was the elder brother. And so Japheth was born first, then Shem, and then Ham. Of the three, Japheth's lineage is given first, either because he's the oldest or because since his descendants later migrated off to the north into Europe, all the way from the British Isles in the west to Russia in the east, and even further to the east. And therefore, Japhethites had far less contact and dealings with the Shemites than Ham did. Verse 2 says, The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Jabin and Tubal and Meshach and Tyrus. And then of these seven sons of Japheth, continuing lineage is given only uh, for Gomer and Jabin. Verse 3, And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Riphath and Tagarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim and Dodanim. And by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue and their families and their nations. Verse 5 here then is a preview of later developments referring to what took place after the languages were confused at Babel in chapter 11. And in this verse, verse 5, we are actually also given the definition, the biblical definition of a nation, that being a group of people that migrated to a certain location 
who share a common language and who trace their lineage to a common ancestor. Biblical definition of a nation. A group of people that migrated to a certain location, share a common language, and who trace their lineage to a common ancestor. And by that definition, I say it's impossible to call America a nation in the biblical sense today. Much work has been done over the centuries to try to pinpoint where each of these families of nations settled in what verse 5 calls their lands. With many of the family has mentioned in this, in this chapter, it's either impossible or guesswork at best to do so. With some, however, it's fairly well known where they settled initially. As I covered in a message just over a year ago on the Ezekiel 38 prophecy of the Gog Magog War, Japheth's oldest son Gomer, with his son Tagarma, initially settled in what is now Central and Western Asia Minor, what's now Western Turkey in the region of Galatia. Magog and Tubal in the regions of Armenia and Scythia, east of the Black Sea. Meshach, farther north into Russia, being the name Moscow is derived from. Madai, then settled over to the east, uh, north of Persia, by the Caspian Sea, uh, later called the Kingdom of the Medes, who then formed an alliance with Persia to conquer Babylon, we read about later in the Bible. Japheth's fourth son, Javan, moved westward into Macedonia and Greece. Gomer and Javan's sons then migrated westward and populated Western Europe into Scandinavia and the British Isles. Verse 6, and the sons of Ham, Cush, Misraim, Phut, and Canaan. Ham's descendants spread out in different directions. Cush to the east primarily, though Canaan, of course, uh, populated the eastern coastlands of the Mediterranean. Misraim and Phut, uh, southward into Africa. Misraim, by the way, uh, later became Egypt. It's another name for Egypt. While Phut settled west of Egypt in the region of Libya. Cush's sons also went in different directions. Cush himself leaving traces both in northern Arabia to the east and also Africa to the south. We then read in verse 8 to 12. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher, and built Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Calah, and Reason between Nineveh and Calah, the same as a great city. Nimrod is a very important figure in this chapter, who in some ways prefigures the man of sin and son of perdition that is yet to take center stage on the world scene before Christ returns. And so I'll come back to these verses in a moment. And Misraim, that's Egypt, begot Ludim, and Anamim, and Laabim, and Naphuthim, and Pathrusim, and Kaslohim, out of whom came Philistim and Kaphtarim. These tribes moved westward across North Africa with Kaslohim apparently uh, crossing the Mediterranean northwards to the islands of Crete and Cyprus where the Philistines and the Kaphtarim originally settled then before the Philistines then again migrated eastward to invade western Palestine. They were a ship-going people and they moved, migrated eastward then to invade Palestine later on. We read about that in three Old Testament passages Deuteronomy 2.23 says the Kaphtarim invaded the land of the Canaanite Avims, or Avims, and wiped them out and dwelt in their land. Jeremiah 47.4 refers to the Philistines as the remnant of the country of Kaphtor. And Amos 9.7 says, Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have I not brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt? and the Philistines from Kaphtor, and the Syrians from Kerr. So the Lord brought the Philistines from Kaphtor to invade western Canaan. The Philistines were then descendants of Ham, but they were not Canaanites. They invaded the land from the west. Verses 15 to 19 then describe the various Canaanite tribes who inhabited the land from the Mediterranean to the east of the Jordan River. Then we read in verse 20, These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Verse 21, 
unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. Japheth the elder, he's the oldest of the three. That verse says Shem was the brother of Japheth, not that Eber was. Eber is given special mention in this verse, however, because it was from Eber that the Hebrew language is named and through whom the lineage of the promised Messiah is continued. Which then goes from Shem to Arphaxad in verse 22, to Selah and then to Eber in verse 24, and then to Peleg in verse 25. These are the men that continued the line of the Messiah. As we read in verse 24, And Arphaxad begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber, and unto Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Interesting comment there. That phrase referring to the confusion of tongues that occurred at Babel we're going to read about in a minute. And his brother, Peleg's brother's name was Joktan. Verse 26 to 30 there lists Joktan's sons. While well, Peleg's lineage is not given again until we get to chapter 11 after the confusion of tongues at Babel where the focus of the entire Old Testament again turns to the line of the promised Messiah, the Lord Jesus. We then read in verse 31 this chapter. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, and in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. They all came through those three sons. That is a condensed nutshell summary of chapter 10. So, I want to come back here to verse 8 to 12. Verse 8 says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. It's said that Nimrod was a mighty hunter not only of beasts, uh, even adorning himself in tiger skins, according to one legend, but that he was also a hunter for the souls of men, whose very name means to rebel or let us rebel. His name means rebellion. And acting in rebellion against God, he was actually a hunter for the hearts and souls of men to turn men against God. That he did so before the Lord, it means Nimrod knew about the Lord. He knew God's will. He knew God's sovereignty. And he knew God's laws to the extent that they had been revealed and written on men's hearts. But he acted in defiance and in rebellion against the Lord. Uh, devising a plan whereby he could rule over men in place of God is what he did. He was apparently a master politician, being the first man in the Bible to form a kingdom, a monarchical government under which he managed to bring men in subjection to it. And so in that way, Nimrod was a hunter after men before the Lord. He sought to be seen as a god, basically who could rule over men in the Lord's place. And so we read in verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Verse 11 says, Out of that land went forth Asher. That phrase actually meaning Nimrod went forth to Asher after the dispersion of Babel took place. He went forth to Asher and builded Nineveh. That was built by Nimrod as well. And builded Nineveh, the city of Rehoboth and Kala, and reason between Nineveh and Kala. The same as a great city. So he's a builder of cities. And the statement here that Nimrod builded Babel first and then these other cities shows that he was a great political organizer. He was a great motivator of men. Also telling us that the work of the building of Tower of Babel, we see that in chapter 11, was led by Nimrod himself as an act of defiance and rebellion against God. That brings us to chapter 11 then, which gives us more details of Nimrod's political and spiritual mischief. Genesis 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they had dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, that being a phrase, by the way, meaning come together here to accomplish a common purpose. Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. In the King James Bible, meaning through and through. Stone itself is not readily available in that eastern land of Shinar, the Babylonian region. 
So they made bricks from clay in much the same manner as bricks are produced today. Baked them in a hot oven. They had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar, the Bible says. Slime, by the way, meaning a bituminous asphalt like tar. That was plentiful in that area. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Nimrod and his followers wanted to be men of renown. They wanted to be famous, make a name for themselves like the mighty men and the men of renown that we read of back in Genesis 6, who perished in the flood. That statement also implies a quest for empire there. They want to be men of renown. They want to make a name for themselves. Josephus says in volume 4 of his treatise, Antiquity of the Jews, that Nimrod sought revenge against God for wiping out his ancestors, and he wanted a tower high enough to escape a similar flood if one came again. But that's highly doubtful, since they already had God's promise never to do that again. And if that was their intention, they would not have chosen that low, flat plain of Shinar to build this tower in. And also, obviously, there wouldn't be enough space at the top to protect very many people. So I don't think that's the reason they built the tower. But I do believe there's uh, more to the motivation here from a spiritual perspective in that the tower was designed as an affront to God himself, somewhat as Lucifer says in Isaiah 14, verse 14. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. They too would be like the Most High, or they would come as near him as they could. Then the verse says, Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And this really may be the heart of the rebellion here. God had commanded Noah and his sons to be fruitful and multiply and to spread out and fill the earth. Nimrod said, no, let's not do that. Let's come together instead, make a name for ourselves right here. Let's have one government, everybody get together here. And the Lord, verse 5, came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. In other words, not that they can accomplish anything they set out to do, but more that they will proceed from one evil to another with no restraint whatsoever, just like men did before the flood. And then just as the triune God, Jehovah, said in chapter 1 of Genesis, let us make man in our image, here it appears the Father said to the Son and the Spirit, mocking, as it were, this pitiful and foolish attempt of man to be, become like God, saying, Go to, let us go down. And there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. This entire effort was led by Nimrod and could therefore be termed Nimrod's rebellion. This was the world's first attempt to unite mankind, all of mankind, under one ruler. I believe it's pretty clear that Nimrod, whose very name means to rebel, prefigures or stands as a type of that lawless man of sin to come, known as the Antichrist. Here, Revelation 13, 7 says, We'll make war against the saints to overcome them, and who will be given power and authority over all kindreds, all tongues, and nations. Depictions of that Tower of Babel are used today by globalists to depict their soon coming New World Order. I've seen them on posters. They see themselves as rebuilding that Tower of Babel. In preparation for which day, the devil's crowd, who in their warped, reprobate, hell-bent, and very foolish minds long for that day to come, gather together in their secret societies and even their public forums, including the World Economic Forum. Again, saying, go to. Let's come together for a common cause. Let's build a new world order. Plotting and scheming and preparing literally for the past several centuries to finally bring the devil's dream kingdom to pass, which, of course, will, in fact, quickly turn into a nightmare. And now it appears that they are pulling out all the stops and they are preparing 
to take more extreme measures in the very near future, this year, to make that nightmare a reality that we all need to be aware of, meaning even more extreme measures than the pre-planned, staged bio-warfare operation of the Thank you for tuning in to this message. But unfortunately, due to YouTube's restrictive policies against truth, free speech, and public awareness, we can only post an excerpt of this message to YouTube. To hear the message in full, you can do so through our other platforms, including Sermon Audio, Rumble, or Odyssey, all of which can be accessed from the sermons page on our website at independencebaptist.com. And thank you for your continued support of this online ministry.